Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Madeline Enright and I'm a project officer at ACTA, the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance. The topic of our webinar today is accessing MBS and PBS data for clinical trials. And this will be presented by Dr. Anna Kemp Casey. This is the final episode of a four part series on linked data for clinical trialists. So before we get to the main presentation today, I just have a couple of acknowledgements and housekeeping items. First and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge that this project has been a collaboration between ACTA, the Population Health Research Network, and the Australian Research Data Commons, who in turn received support from the Australian Government through NCRIS. I'd also like to acknowledge the operational funding ACTA received from the Australian Government's Medical Research Future Fund. Just a quick reminder as well that these webinars are being recorded and will be available on our website shortly. So if you've missed any or want to review anything we cover today, please head over to clinicaltrialsalliance.org.au where you'll find the relevant links in our latest news section. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be on hand to address any technical questions or issues that you might be having and I'll read out any of the content related questions for Anna a little bit later on. Now I'm pleased to get around to introducing our presenter for today, Dr. Anna Kemp Casey. Anna is a research fellow with the Medicines and Device Surveillance Centre for Research Excellence at the University of South Australia. Her research focus is medicines policy and its impact on utilisation, particularly amongst vulnerable population groups. She has a decade of experience analysing large Australian health data sets, including the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme and Medicare Benefits Schedule. Anna is a former member of the Drug Utilisation Subcommittee of the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, which provide expert advice on medicine utilisation in Australia. She is also the co-founder of Medicines Use Research Australia, a nationwide group of academics, clinicians and policymakers with an interest in medicines utilisation research. She's trained over 250 academics, policymakers and clinicians across Australia to analyse and interpret routinely collected pharmacy and health services data. And she also has over 50 peer reviewed publications and has received over $4 million in competitive funding. Welcome, Anna. Thanks very much, Madeline. Um, welcome, everybody. Just make sure you can all see my slides. Okay, hopefully you all can. Uh, welcome to the, the final of these seminar courses on using linked data for clinical trials. So today we're going to be talking about MBS and PBS data in clinical trials um, and hopefully convince you of why this is going to be a really useful, useful data source to supplement your clinical trial. Um, I've been working with MBS and PBS data for more than 10 years, as Madeline said. Um, I think they're fantastic data sources and I uh, hope you'll find them as useful as I have. Um, so as Madeline says, I do do some training for researchers who are interested in using MBS and PBS data. Um, usually that's run over a full day. So obviously we've just got an hour together now. Uh, so it's going to be a very top line um, coverage of, of the data sets. But, but what I hope to give you is just a sense of, of what the data can do, um, what sorts of variables are available and make you aware of a few limitations that I think are good to know about before you start requesting data. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm just trying to advance my slides, there we go. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the, the purpose and a description of the data sets. We're going to talk about how I think this, these data sets can contribute to other clinical trial data. Um, talk about some of the strengths and limitations of these data sets when you use them for research, because they're originally not designed for research purposes. I'm um, going to tell you where you can find data dictionaries for the MBS and PBS and talk about the sorts of variables that are available. Uh, then we're going to talk about applying for data and, and just a few things I think you should be aware of, particularly if you decide to obtain participant consent for MBS and PBS data. And finally, talk about some of the resources I think you need to analyse these data sets. Okay, so we'll start with the MBS, the Medicare Benefit Schedule. So this was set up in the early 80s and the intention was to provide all Australians with access to healthcare. Um, so, so 
given that, um, it is what you, you would think it is. It's a list of subsidised medical services that are available to, um, to Australians. So we're talking about medical services that are provided either by medical doctors or other allied health professionals. And those services can either be provided in the community, so to outpatients, or they can be provided in the hospital setting. Um, one important thing to know about MBS data is it only captures services that are provided in hospital if they're provided to private inpatients, um, not to public inpatients, just private ones. So we're talking about things like general practice and specialist attendances, therapeutic and diagnostic procedures, and those allied health items like pathology and optometry. What the MBS doesn't capture is services provided to public inpatients. So we've got we've got public inpatients, but not sorry, private inpatients, but not public. And that's a really important caveat to know about going in. Uh, if you're interested in collecting data about services provided in hospitals and you're likely to be wanting to know about public patients in terms of your trial, then MBS data alone isn't going to be sufficient for you. You'll also need to have the relevant hospital data collection from your state or territory. So I think that's important to know going in. Um, there's nothing like waiting for your MBS and PBS data and having it provided to you and then realising that there's a section of data that you are counting on that, that isn't there. So, so just be aware that public inpatient data is not in the MBS. What's also not captured by the MBS is services obviously that aren't MBS listed. So things like remedial massage. Uh, we're also not capturing services which are on the MBS, but when the patient doesn't meet the subsidy criteria, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So the PBS is the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. That was established uh, much longer ago than the MBS. It, it goes back to 1948. And the aim there was to provide Australians with access to affordable essential medicines. So we're talking about a list of subsidised prescription medicines that are either dispensed from community pharmacies or from hospital pharmacies. So when it comes to hospital pharmacies, we've got full capture for private patients, whether those are inpatients or outpatients, getting medicines from uh, from a hospital pharmacy. In terms of public patients getting medicines from hospitals, we don't have medicines that are supplied to patients for the period that they're an inpatient. So if you get your statin, for example, on day two of your, uh, your five-day hospital stay, that is not captured in the PBS data. What is captured is PBS dispensings that are given to patients on discharge. And when that happens typically is when uh, a patient's initiated on a new therapy while they're in hospital, and then they're given enough uh, to take away with them on discharge, usually to last them a weekend or until they could get to the GP and, and get another script filled. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, and they are New South Wales and the ACT. We'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, but in every other state and territory, hospital dispensings on discharge to public patients are captured in the PBS. What the PBS doesn't capture is over-the-counter medicines, so those items that aren't uh, on prescription, things like paracetamol. Um, medicines that aren't listed on the PBS, obviously there's no capture about those, so there's plenty of medicines that aren't PBS listed and they tend to be medicines that aren't considered essential, so things like Viagra for example. Um, and then we've got medicines which are on the PBS, but where the patient isn't meeting the criteria for subsidy. Um, and again, I'll, I'll explain about that now. So talked about item restrictions. Um, this is a, a feature in both the MBS and the PBS data. Um, and what this means is that there's some sort of uh, clinical criteria or population subgroup which are considered uh, eligible for that treatment. And then if, you, if you're not meeting those criteria, um, you're not eligible for subsidy. So within Medicare, um, that's based on clinical need. And within the PBS, those rules are generally based on cost effectiveness. So patients are still able to be referred for, um, for services or be prescribed medicines where they don't meet the criteria. So that's entirely possible, but those, those services and medicines aren't captured in the MBS and PBS data sets. So they're things we would refer to as private scripts or private services. <laughs> 
So just to give you an example within the MBS, rhinoplasty or a nose job uh, is MBS subsidised, but only in cases of significant deformity. So not just for cosmetic preference, for example. So there has to be clinical need. And an example within the PBS would be something like for Buxostat, which is a treatment for gout. It costs about $50 a month. Uh, that's only subsidised for patients who have gout and can't tolerate allopurinol, which is a much cheaper uh, clinical alternative that works just as well for most people. So that's an example of how cost effectiveness comes into play within the PBS restrictions. So when we're talking about who is covered by these data sets, um, fortunately for us as researchers, it's it's almost everybody. So anyone with a Medicare card which would be all Australian citizens, all permanent residents, uh, and also uh, visitors from countries that have reciprocal health care agreements with Australia. So the UK, New Zealand, Italy, um, a handful of other countries. Uh, the exceptions to, to this coverage are people in uh, the armed services. Um, the health care of those individuals is funded by the Department of Defence, so it's not captured in the MBS and PBS data, which is funded by the Department of Health. Um, the other exception are prisoners. Um, their health care is paid for by um, the Departments of Justice in the relative state or territory. So, so those are the only exceptions in terms of MBS and PBS coverage. But really, we, we are as close to true universal coverage as it gets by international standards, and, and that's a really special thing about MBS and PBS data. Um, most other data sets uh, in other countries that, that cover large populations aren't completely representative, so they tend to exclude um, you know, the most low income people or they only cover um, the very ill and the very, uh, the very poor. So it's, it's quite special to have uh, data sets like the MBS and PBS with, with such full coverage. There are two ways I think MBS and PBS data could be really useful to you when you're planning or running your clinical trials. Firstly is in terms of collection of pre-trial patient history. So presumably you're going to be collecting a lot of information from your participants about the disease or the condition that, that is of primary interest for your intervention. So I imagine you would have a lot of that sort of information. But there'll be lots of other health context information that you'll want to have about participants. So things like their comorbidities, their medication history, um, how often they're seeing um, clinicians and, and other uh, other allied health workers, for example, those things might be important in terms of um, testing whether your randomization has been successful. Um, it might be important in terms of screening for eligibility for your clinical trial. So, so I think this can be a really useful resource, um, potentially going back many, many years. So um, it's most it's most easy to request data that go back five years from the time of extraction, but it is possible to get data going further back with MBS and PBS. So we're really talking some, some quite long-term um, history prior to your clinical trial starting. One of the reasons that MBS and PBS data is really nice for this is because then you're not relying on participant self-report. Um, generally self-report's good for um, very salient conditions, but, but often participants aren't great at recalling the precise timing of diagnoses. Um, they're not very good at accurately reporting exactly how uh, adherent they've been with medications and things like that. So, so this is an example of where MBS and PBS data can be incredibly useful because you have highly accurate and reliable detailed information about the timings of health services and medicines. Uh, I think there's also some advantages over chart review, um, depending on the information you're looking at, um, because doing a detailed chart review for background comorbidities and timings and medicines is extremely time consuming. And it also assumes that you've got access to all of the, all of the charts that you require. So you're likely, say, to have hospital records, but you might not have general practice records. Um, so I think this can be a, a really nice uh, supplementation for, for clinical trial data. Uh, the other way I think MBS and PBS data can be useful to you is to assist with follow-up. So you can potentially use MBS and PBS data. Uh, you can have it sent to you in instalments or get an update, say, two years after your trial finishes, uh, and then have access to some, some long-term data in terms of the sorts of health resources and medicines that your participants have used. Um, 
sometimes they can be good proxies for particular health outcomes, uh, either clinical outcomes or, or adverse events in some cases. So again, this can be a way of reducing participant burden and also the sorts of uh, resources that are required for you in terms of uh, research to time. So the, the strengths, I think, of using MBS and PBS data for clinical trials uh, would be the full population coverage. So it's highly likely that anyone you've recruited for your clinical trials is going to exist in the broader MBS and PBS data set. You've also got the advantage of national coverage. So if you're um, involving participants that have possibly travelled for uh, for medical treatment across state or jurisdiction lines uh, or that have had scripts filled in other jurisdictions, that's not an issue with the MBS and PBS because we've got national coverage of, of all of those items. Again, we're talking about an objective and reliable capture of services and their timing and you've got reduced burden on participants and their families uh, and researchers. There are some limitations as well of using MBS and PBS data. The key one being that not all services and medicines that are provided to patients are going to be included in the data set. Right? It's just those services and medicines that are subsidised and therefore captured under the MBS and PBS schemes. So these data sets don't specifically collect information on diagnosis or clinical outcomes. Um, this is a, a big limitation. Um, we, would, we would really like to know, for example, whether that antidepressant was uh, prescribed for a patient because of depression or for anxiety or for migraine management or one of the myriad of other things that could be used for. Um, that information isn't captured in, in the MBS or the PBS. Um, but sometimes we can make really good inferences depending on what the item is. The other thing to be aware of is that data capture can vary by state and territory. Um, so one of those ways I've already mentioned um, is that um, in terms of the PBS data set, not all of the states and territories are contributing data about public patients at the time of discharge. So the, the key exceptions there are, are New South Wales and the ACT, the other states and territories do. Uh, the other issue is that there is some variation between jurisdictions in terms of what's considered an inpatient procedure and what's therefore outpatient. And we know that PBS data only captures outpatient procedures uh, for public patients. It captures inpatient uh, procedures for private patients too, but in terms of uh, what, what's collected for everybody, it's outpatient procedures. So the example of where this happens is something like radiotherapy, which is considered an outpatient procedure in New South Wales, but it's an inpatient procedure in Victoria. And so you can get some variation in how much is captured in the MBS based on that. So just something to be aware of um, and something to think about in terms of the, I guess, the key services of interest to you and how they're treated in your particular jurisdiction. Um, one of the things that, that the, the group asked me to talk about was any examples of previous studies that have used MBS and PBS data in clinical trials and um, had a, a, a pretty thorough look and have not been able to find any. So um, in a way that's exciting, it means you're all uh, trailblazers potentially um, to, to go ahead and use the MBS and PBS data uh, in the work that you're doing. Of course, there are hundreds of observational studies that have used MBS and PBS data, um, so they're, they're easily found with a, with a keyword search. Um, I do know of one study that's, uh, that's, that's more clinical than an observational trial. It's a, it's a study of outcomes of patients who are uh, registered in the Australian and New Zealand Dialysis and Transplant Registry. So that's um, underway at the moment. Um, there are some preliminary publications coming out about that. So if you're interested to see how those particular studies have used MBS and PBS data, data they, they are around, but so far no clinical trials. I'm just going to talk really briefly about um, how you use coding within the MBS and PBS uh, data sets. So MBS item codes to start with are, are entirely numeric, um, so you won't see any letters in MBS codes. Um, they're between one and five digits long. There's no relationship between the length of the codes and, and what they mean, either in terms of their expense or how recently they're listed on the MBS or anything like that. So don't attach any significance to the number itself. 
I've included the website there for the current MBS schedule. So you can go there and search either by keyword or by item code to see which items are currently listed on the MBS and a description of any um, item restrictions that apply to any of those um, to any of those items. Uh, and then you'll see the website at the bottom of the slide there, which is really important to know about. That will take you to a list of previous MBS schedules. Um, and the reason you need to know about previous MBS schedules is because the schedules are updated uh, routinely. In fact, it's four times a year for, for the MBS that there's some sort of update to the schedule. Now that can either be uh, new items added to the MBS, um, sometimes items are removed from the MBS uh, and sometimes there are changes to the, um, the item restrictions in terms of who is able to access items. So you can't just look at the current MBS schedule and assume that that's going to have all the information you need for your study period. So once you work out how many years of data you're going to be looking uh, backward at in the first instance, um, you need to know where to find the schedules that apply to that period of time. So that's why I've included the website there. In terms of PBS item codes, they are alphanumeric, which is how you'll distinguish it from an MBS item code. Just be aware that sometimes you'll see a trailing zero on the start of a PBS code, um, and you can interpret those codes uh, as if the zero weren't there in those instances. So 2013Y is the same as 02013Y. Each PBS item code uh, is unique to a particular strength of a medication and a preparation. So for example, a, a 50 milligram tablet will have a different item code to a 100 milligram tablet, uh, but the item codes don't distinguish between brands at all. So if you're interested in brands of medicine, in addition to whatever the generic name is of the medicine, um, you'll need to request a, a different variable to get that information. The item code itself won't tell you that. Uh, you can see the, the website there for the current PBS schedule. Um, and again, that's searchable either by item code or by keyword. And then there's the website that will take you to the list of previous PBS schedules, because like the MBS, they are updated uh, routinely. So I've talked about this in terms of the MBS, but it applies to the PBS as well. There are listings and delistings and modifications that happen to the schedule routinely. Um, the PBS schedule is actually updated monthly. So you've got 12 potential changes per year, although it's very rare that one class of medicines would be affected um, in such rapid succession. But, but, but do be aware if you're looking at a wide range of medicines and health services, that it's likely something will have have changed over your data period and so that's why it's really important to have access to previous schedules um, as well as the, the most current. Um, so what I tend to recommend that people do is, is at a minimum to look at the PBS and MBS schedules at the start, middle and end of the data period that you're interested with. And that way you know you're not going to be missing any historic codes, so codes that aren't currently on the schedule but they were at the time that your data was collected or, or vice versa, because you don't want incomplete data capture. So data dictionaries, um, I'll just talk about for a moment. Um, it's, it seems really obvious that um, there should be a data dictionary for the MBS and PBS uh, data sets. There are now, but these are really new. So these were only actually compiled by the Commonwealth in 2015. So for a decade or so before that, researchers were using MBS and PBS data, but with no data dictionary. So we, we literally didn't know what variables we could request or how they were formatted or what the variables met. Um, and so there was a lot of whispering in corridors between researchers trying to find out what other people had received in their data extraction. So we knew potentially what we could ask for uh, when we applied for data. Um, we're no longer in that position, thankfully. So, so there are data dictionaries for the MBS and the PBS, and I've, I've got the websites for you there. Um, a limitation with this is that these data dictionaries were written to go with one particular extract of MBS and PBS data. And that was a cut of one financial year uh, that the Commonwealth gave to the states and territories for 2013-2014. Um, so that was a, a, I guess a one off exercise to see whether the states would find it useful to have their, um, their jurisdictions MBS and PBS data so they could analyse that along with their locally collected data. Um, 
So because that was a one-off extraction, um, the data dictionaries are specific to that cut. So you may find when you actually receive data that variables aren't called the same thing in your cut as they are in the data dictionary. Um, and that's because likely extracted by a different person and obviously at a different point in time. Um, so it's it's not ideal. It's not, um, I guess, a universal data dictionary, but it is the best thing we have in terms of MBS and PBS data. So I won't go through all of the variables available in the MBS, but I just want to give you a sense of what people tend to use most commonly. Um, obviously, a patient identifier. Um, now, that's obviously not uh, not name or address or anything identifying. It's the scrambled ID, but it will allow you to link together records that belong to the same individual. Um, patient sex is there, patient date of birth. Often uh, the Commonwealth are reluctant to give out full date of birth, but I'm assuming for a clinical trial situation that's not a problem because you will obviously have information on, on full date of birth, but, but just be aware that the variable you get is probably not as detailed as the other information you have. Um, each record on your MBS uh, data will have an MBS item code, so there's literally one record per healthcare encounter. Uh, there'll be a date of service and a date of processing. Talk about that a bit more in a moment. There's an indicator flag to let you know whether the procedure took place in hospital or not. Um, there are some uh, what they call broad types of services which group things together. So obstetric items all come under one code, for example, um, to save you so putting in 100 individual MBS item codes. Sometimes that's useful. Um, there is a de-identified uh, scrambled number assigned to each provider in the data set. So if if it's important for you to be able to group together um, the sorts of services provided by particular clinicians, that's possible. Uh, there's also some information on the specialty of the provider and the provider's location. Um, that location information tends to be quite um, quite broad, so it's, it's at ARIA level, so usually major city, inner regional, outer regional, remote and very remote, but I believe it is possible to request more detailed geographic information if that's important. The two dates I mentioned in the MBS data are date of service and date of processing. Um, just want to explain the difference. They, they look identical and often in your data set those dates will be identical. But the date of service is literally the day the service was provided, so the day the patient saw the GP. The date of processing is the date that that claim for service was processed by the Department of Health. So um, now that things are done electronically, the date of service and the date of processing are, are often the same date, but you probably all remember the day when you had to take your form into Medicare and get your cash reimbursement. Uh, that is date of processing. So it, it can lag behind the date of process, sort of behind the date of service by some months. So the reason I want to point that out to you is that I've seen researchers get their data set and there's two columns of dates that look the same when they eyeball them and so they just arbitrarily delete one and use the other. Please don't do that. Um, just be aware of what the difference is and, and make sure you're, you are analysing the date that's doing what you think it's doing. In terms of the PBS data, uh, there are a lot of similar variables again, so things like patient ID, sex, date of birth, uh, there's information on beneficiary status, so whether they're a concessional or general beneficiary. Uh, the generic name of the medicine, that's the international non-proprietary name. You can also request brand name if that's of interest to you. Um, ATC codes we can talk about later if that's of interest to anybody, but that is captured in the PBS data. Um, the information about the quantity supplied, so was it a pack of 30 or a bottle of 100 or, or what was the quantity of the medicine. Uh, whether it was an original or a repeat prescription. And then we've got three dates that are sometimes confused, date of service, date of prescription and date of processing. And then again, we've got information about the prescriber, a scrambled identifier and their specialty. Um, and then some information on the location of the prescriber and the location of the dispensing pharmacy. Uh, the dates work much the same in the PBS as in the MBS. Uh, we've got the date of supply, which is equivalent to the date of service in Medicare data. So that's the date that the, the medicine was actually dispensed to the patient. 
Data processing, again, is when the Department of Health processes the claim. And the data prescription is when the prescriber physically writes the script uh, for the patient. So when you have medicines that come with repeats, so say you have an original and five repeats, all six of those dispensings will have the same date of prescription. And again, I'm just pointing this out so that you don't choose one arbitrarily when you're doing your analysis. Okay, just a few important uh, dates to know about as well within the PBS relates to that capture of discharge supply to public patients who have been in hospital. And as I mentioned, that happens in all states except New South Wales and the ACT. For the other jurisdictions, there are different dates when that data capture started. Um, I've listed them here and they're listed in the um, in the written guidance that you'll all be getting as well after today. So, so those dates are there. Again, it's just for your reference so that you know how far back data can go in your jurisdiction with that information being captured. So I'm, I'm sure you've covered some of this already in, in previous episodes, but in terms of where to apply for data, so, so any data linkage that involves MBS and PBS data uh, needs to be done either through the Population Health Research Network or by the AIHW. Um, we've included the websites there. Um, those websites both have very detailed information about uh, what the processes are and, and how you get started in terms of your um, application for data. And I know you've talked uh, in previous weeks as well about issues of consent. So you've got the, um, you've got two options with your linked administrative data. You can either go um, the participant consent route, which is I think the most straightforward, or you can try to apply for a waiver to obtain data without consent. Um, so I'm sure everything's being said that needs to be said about the without consent option. I just wanted to make you aware of something that applies to MBS and PBS data if you decide to get participant consent. Now, I'm assuming this is the most straightforward thing for you to do because you're going to be conducting clinical trials and you're likely to be consenting all of your participants for the trial anyway. So, um, so those barriers that might otherwise exist for an epidemiological study aren't there for you. So you are having contact with participants at some point. Um, so often it's easiest to get consent for MBS and PBS data at that time. I um, just want you to be aware that the Department of Health have very particular uh, requirements when it comes to the wording of participant information forms and consent forms for MBS and PBS data. Um, so I've seen researchers before who have put together all of their um, study materials, um, consent forms and information letters uh, pertaining to other data sets that are held, say, by a state or territory. Um, the wording is suitable for all of those custodians and then they've decided to add MBS and PBS data into the mix. And then sort of at the last moment, it seems, um, the Department of Health say the, the wording of those consent forms is not going to be suitable. Um, so just be aware before you start putting time and effort into preparing those materials that you'll need to, to contact the Department of Health about whatever their most current template is for wording. So you're unlikely to be able to modify something you already have. Um, and it's worth checking with them quite regularly um, up to the time you actually start consenting participants because there are quite frequent changes uh, in terms of the requirements that they have. Okay, so I'm just going to talk briefly about um, four key resources I think you need if you're going to successfully analyse MBS and PBS data. First one is a clear research question. Um, now that possibly sounds uh, so evident it doesn't need to be said, but it's, um, it's amazing how often <laughs> researchers do try to do this. Um, obviously, you'll all be very clear in terms of the main focus of your clinical trial, what you're doing, um, but it's often then when it comes to risk adjustment or, um, or extra variables that you decide um, you might want to look at in terms of your randomization being successful or um, you know, the timing of comorbidities and things like that. Um, people often start fishing around in the data trying to sort of see what looks interesting. Um, and that's not a very successful approach for MBS and PBS data. Uh, one of the big issues is that the volume of data that you're going to have uh, on its own is, is really enormous. So because you're getting uh, a line of data per healthcare encounter, um, we're talking 
thousands of records per participant. So I've had data sets that are millions of records long, even when the actual number of participants is quite small. So it is a, a voluminous amount of data. Um, and if you start sort of fishing around, just looking for statistically significant associations, you will find a lot of them that aren't clinically meaningful. So um, I would really advise you to be very clear on what you're trying to do with the MBS and PBS data um, and, and plan your, your analysis uh, appropriately. It will also help you be very clear about which items are relevant and which ones aren't and which sort of time periods and lead in periods uh, are going to be appropriate. The second one is time. Um, so this, this can really sneak up on you how much time is involved in, in requesting and receiving and analysing MBS and PBS data. Um, so just in terms of the, the ethics approval process and then the actual provision of data itself once all your approvals are in place. So it's often over a year between uh, when you start applying for permission when the data actually come. So you, you need to obviously know that while you're planning your clinical trial uh, because you don't want to be delaying recruitment, for example, um, thinking that this data is going to come and that's going to be useful to you and you want it before yeah, before you start recruiting or any of any of that sort of thing. You, you really want to be uh, on the front foot knowing the sort of timelines involved. The other thing that's more time consuming um, often than people think is the preparation of the data sets for analysis. Um, yeah, so this is not something that, um, that your statistician turns around in a couple of weeks. So syntax writing is the, is the third thing I, I would really recommend. So uh, people often ask, which are the appropriate statistics packages to use for MBS and PBS data. Um, it really doesn't matter. A lot of people are using more simple packages like SBSS uh, all the way through to SAS and R and, and other programs. Really doesn't matter as long as you're using syntax and not the drop down menus. There's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, you'll want to have a detailed record of what you've done in terms of your analysis. Um, reviewers often have questions, you know, two years down the road when you're publishing your fourth paper and you don't remember the detail of, of what you did early on because there are so many decisions made. So it's good to have a record for that. But mostly it's because you'll end up rebuilding your analysable data file many, many times. So the, the challenge with MBS and PBS data is not the statistical analysis. That's something that takes 1% of your time right at the end. It's doing your Cox regression. The, the, the time consuming part is taking these data sets that have multiple records per person, sometimes hundreds of records per person, and turning that into one analyzable data set that has one line per person with all the relevant information in it. That, that's what takes all the time. And you'll often find that you need to refine and rebuild that data set dozens and dozens of times before before you have something that's analyzable. So if you are using drop down menus to recreate those thousands of steps every time, you're going to be very miserable with your life. So yeah, write syntax. The fourth thing I'd suggest is to make lots of friends. Uh, absolutely anyone who will talk to you about MBS or PBS data is worth having a conversation with. Um, so really helpful people are clinicians from other specialties, pharmacists, clinical coders, Consumers can be really useful for, um, for shedding light on some quirks of the data that, that don't make sense to anybody else. Um, there's just so much complexity that goes into interpreting these data sets and it's just unlikely that any one of us um, has all of that expertise alone. So teams are, are really incredibly valuable for, for analysing this data well. So that actually brings me to the end of, of the slides that I had um, set aside, but we've got plenty of time for questions. So I will uh, put my monitor back on and uh, ask Madeline if there are any questions that have come in in writing. Well, thanks so much um, for that, Anna. That was incredibly comprehensive. Um, I certainly found it very useful. And we have some comments coming in here from other people online saying thank you very much. So that's great. Um, just a reminder to everybody else, uh, you can add your questions in the box. Thank you very much. Um, we have had one comment come in from Felicity, who you might remember as the presenter from the other three webinars. I do indeed. 
Um, and she's just mentioned slight typo. Um, if you are looking to get MBS PBS data, please contact the Department of Human Services, not the Department of Health, for wording on the information sheets and consent forms. Right, thank you. Yes, sorry, they um, they change their name quite regularly. Yes. <laughs> and just a reminder to everyone that um, we will have a guidance document that um, Anna and Felicity are very kindly writing up at the moment on all four webinars um, on data linkage, and that will be available on our website shortly should you wish to review any more of this information. Um, so we've just had one question come in here from Jeremy. Are items and drugs supplied in the emergency setting in a hospital considered in or outpatient services? Oh, that is such a good question. I would, I would need to check this for you, Jeremy. But I would assume it's outpatients. They're not. They're not admitted patients at that time. So I believe they would be considered outpatient. The, so the only caveat would be whether they're improst items rather than because they're not just yes yeah, so they're outpatient but they're not dispensed through the pharmacy I think because they would be they would be in the improst so I would think they're outpatient but not captured would be my best advice but um, please do email me I will try to clarify that for you um, my email address is in the written guidance so chase me up I'll find out for you Thanks very much for that, Anna. Now, just while we wait for other questions to come in, we might give people a few more minutes. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning that you do whole day training sessions on this. So where could people find out some more information about that? Oh, sure. Um, yes, if you uh, get in touch with the Sachs Institute, that's SAX Institute, they're in Sydney and um, we run those a few times a year and we're running them online much in a in a format like this. So the next one of those is running in June. So yes, yeah, so do get in touch with um, info at the Sachs Institute or email me again. Um, my, my email address is, is there in the written guidance and I can let you know the dates for the next one. Great, thank you. Um, we might give people just a few more minutes. Oh, we've had one question sure. come in. <laughs> Um, in MBS data, since there are multiple rows per participant on the same day, how do you find duplication in the data set that you receive? Or how do you find the unique rows per participant? Right, so so two questions there. So so yes, there's a line per, um, per encounter. So each encounter will have a different MBS item number. So, um, so there might be a visit to the general practice general practice, for example, where you'll get an item for a level B consult, you know, a consult that's less than 20 minutes, so that will have an item number. And there might also be by the same provider. So you'll see things like that. If you see uh, more than one item on the same date for a participant that's likely to be a mistake so that that shouldn't happen uh, that would be um, an unnecessary duplication or an incorrect duplication um, it's rare to see a, an error like that come through but it's possible great thanks very much for that um, we have another question here you mentioned earlier that generally you can access mbs pbs data from the last five years quite easily and if you want anything further back than that it's a little bit more difficult could you outline the difference in the process there sure so i can um i can tell you this as much as i know certainly so um so the reason it's difficult to access data that's more than five years old is that the department basically don't have it ready to hand so they keep in in the department um, the last five years worth of data so at any given time um, that the last date from five years ago's data is being um, uh, discarded from the their working data set and and the most recent day in the five years will, will be there so at the time that extraction happens it's easy for them to just take a cut of what's there in their um, accessible data set so that goes back five years um, data older than that is archived so it does exist 
the department can access it, but it's more difficult for them to do so. So uh, I don't think the procedure is different for asking for that data. I think that it would be the same, it's the same application form, uh, but I think you would have to give a, a fairly solid argument for why you want data that precedes the five year mark. And I imagine that cost recovery would be higher for data going back that far because it will just involve more staff and, and more difficulty for them to extract it. So that, to, to the best of my ability, that, that would be the difference. Great, thank you. Um, now we're just also having a couple of comments saying in that your audio cut out when you were talking about um, duplicate items. So would you mind just going over that a little bit more? Sure, sure. Um, so sorry. Ho hopefully you can all you can all hear me now. Um, so there there shouldn't be duplicate items within within the data set, although it can happen with both the MBS and PBS. Um, as a rule, you shouldn't see the same item number used more than once on the same day. So um, so a duplicate would be two items that are the same item number with the same date. Um, for the same patient. So that, that would be a duplicate. Um, you often will see several things that happen on the same day for the same patient. So they might go to the GP and they'll have a, uh, a consultation that's less than 20 minutes. So that has an item code. And while they're there, they might also have a chronic disease management plan written for them that will have a separate item code. So there'll be more than one thing happening on one day, but it won't be the same item number. So, so generally that's how you would distinguish between um, what's a real real record and what's a duplicate. Great, thank you. Well, and it looks like we've covered off all of our questions there. So thanks again, and thanks everybody for your participation um, today. Um, we'll hopefully see you next week for a presentation on studies with a trial by Professor Sean Trawick. Um, but as Sean is based in the UK, we've had to modify our schedule. So next week's webinar will be screening at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. I hope you're able to make it. Thanks again, Anna, and we'll see you soon. Welcome. Thank you all.